We should get on with the rest of our program. And, and again, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Michael Kluckner. I'm president of the uh, Vancouver Historical Society. And uh, welcome to our 2024 Incorporation Day Luncheon. And uh, the, the little program in front of you says is lunch and learn. We've had a terrific lunch. Now let's see what the learning turns out to be like. <laughs> And, uh, and I, hope, uh, I hope most of you will be able to turn, uh, turn your chairs and see these screens. Um, I've plumbed deep into my not so huge collection of old postcards of Vancouver, old color postcards to, uh, to illustrate part of this. And um, so just to, and the Incorporation Day, April the 6th, 1886, this new city called Vancouver that really is a creature of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, five years later, Vancouver Club gets founded, and then at the, um, uh, what is that, 1936, is that Diamond Jubilee? Silver, what's the f golden? The, the golden Jubilee, I think, 1936, that the uh, um, Historical Society gets going. Um, the first time I came here, was for a Christmas dinner, and I think it was 1970. And my girlfriend's grandfather, uh, who was a member here, invited the family, and I got to tag along. And, um, and he was a man by the name of Ray Bicknell, Raymond Bicknell. And um, he owned a couple of companies on False Creek. Um, one called False Creek Industries that manufactured goods for the logging industry primarily and another one called Gulf of Georgia Towing Company. And uh, so this shows the Gulf of Georgia Towing Company wharf, and that's the Granville Bridge in the background in, uh, in the 1940s. And so people like, like Raymond Bicknell, they were employing people at a time, and so not to romanticize it in any way, but this was a time where a working class guy, and it was always a guy, could get a job there, and on the basis of that job could buy a car, a little house, probably in Burnaby, maybe East Van, um, and you know, have some kids and have this, this sort of Canadian dream that, that had been developed at that time. And um, um, his, it was actually his father-in-law, George, George Alexander Wacom, who was the big player in False Creek at that time. And, uh, and so Raymond Bicknell, born 1899 in Steveston, um, you know, he did very well in his life, but it was his father-in-law who was this really big player. And this photograph here was one that I took in about 1982, I think. Uh, this is about where the Olympic Station is on the Canada Line, so just at the Canby Bridge on the South Shore. And so that period then of a kind of an industrial Vancouver and, and the big players in the industrial Vancouver, that gave the Vancouver Club a lot of its early members. And uh, so a photograph like this of a fire in one of the mills in the South Shore of False Creek in the 1920s gives an indication of this. And it was a really actually quite a diverse workforce. The, um, the Sikh community, for example, had most of the people lived between, you would say, the Burrard and the Granville Bridges on the south side, and actually their first Sikh temple was at the corner of Second and Cypress in Kitsilano. So very diverse there. Uh, the, the Japanese community too, there were, there were churches on Fairview Slopes, Japanese churches, and there's still one building on Fairview Slopes that is a tenement that was built by, um, built by Japanese people. That era came to an end in 1960. It was sort of slowly coming to an end with consolidation of forest products companies, but there was an enormous fire on the south shore of, uh, of False Creek in July 1960, and it was one of those sort of triggering moments, or I can't think of another term for it, where um, an old way was passing, passing away. And uh, people began to say, well, we've got this body of water coming into Vancouver. And why don't we do something with it other than it just being an industrial sewer, but an industrial sewer that provided a lot of very, very good um, employment for people. So early 1960s, this aerial postcard view of Vancouver, um, 
tough to see in a big room like this, but the Centennial Pavilion is there in the, in the left foreground, so you know that it's after 1958, the Centennial Pavilion of Vancouver General Hospital. You can see a few high-rises in the downtown, and, but the particular thing that you see at that time is there are still log booms all over False Creek. The mills, you know, there's, some of them are still running, and it's so that it's still this kind of industrial sort of backwater. But we step back a little bit, and a map here showing, you see the UR here, um, there where we are, just very, very close to Burrard Street. And a few things that point out on that, the two villages of the Squamish people. You know, we now, typically we're opening meetings and we're talking about the three local First Nations, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. But this part of Vancouver was pretty much a Squamish area there. And uh, the one village, Hue Hue, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, was on what we now call Stanley Park, on that, that shore there. And then the other one, Sunok, was on an Indian reservation, uh, the Kitsilano Reservation Number no. 6. And that's now the Vanier Park Museum of Vancouver Space Center area, with the 10-acre um, 10 slice of it, that they are developing a, a very, very large development for probably about 10,000 people. And, and you can see the, the towers beginning to go up on either side of, um, of uh, Burrard Bridge. So, the, so it was really Squamish people who were there. And then you will see on, on there, you'll be able to read British Military Reserve 1860. Looks like Stanley Park. What's that, what's that all about? Well, in 1858, when gold was discovered in the Caribou, there was this flood of Americans coming up from California looking for gold. And with just sort of waiting in the wings over the border, the American army, and it looked from the point of view of um, British people at the time that the Americans were going to take over this area. They were going to make it part of the United States. And the British government acted actually quite quickly and declared this area, the mainland of what we now call British Columbia, to be a British colony in, in 1858. There had been an earlier British colony on Vancouver Island since 1849. So, you know, British military reserve there. What happened to the indigenous people who were there? Um, they were tolerated for, for, a few, uh, for a few years, but then later on when Vancouver became established in 1886, they were really unceremoniously kicked out of what we now call Stanley Park. Um, but this British military reserve, if you look at that, you think of the geography of it, yes, a strategic peninsula that would control the entry into Burrard Inlet, and in fact, that was what it, what it was like. And when I was a kid, there was, a, there was still a gun emplacement at Ferguson Point facing west um, uh, towards the, the, effectively the entrance to Vancouver Harbor. But, you know, the fact, and you know, you can debate issues of colonialism and back and forth, but probably the reason why we're not discussing whether to vote for Trump or Biden in November here today is because of that decision that was made and you know British Columbia hung in the balance or the, 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 uh, the name of a fairly recent book by the historian Jean Barman. So what else have we got on this map? The Sunak, I've mentioned that, the, uh, the, the former Kisilano Indian Reserve and uh, the Squamish thing. And so what's the brickmaker's claim, 1862? Well, as soon as the colonial rules got going, uh, settlers who came here, not indigenous people, people, but settlers who came here could preempt in the term of it, they could claim land and they could get title to the land if they made a certain degree of improvements in it over a period of years. And this was an area, of course, of deep, deep forest, wonderful forest. Um, the, uh, it's extraordinary that the uses that indigenous people made of the trees that were there. Um, outer bark for fuel, inner bark for 
medicine, for food, for clothing, for baskets. And of course, the wood itself for the canoes that they wanted and for their, for their own housing. The settler people who came here, the um, people, they, they were mainly interested in, in it as lumber for building. And it was these three guys here, uh, dubbed the three greenhorns by people in the established colonial capital of New Westminster, who bought what was effectively the West End of Vancouver for $555.75 in 1862. So, you know, in retrospect, a bit of a bargain. And they were called, they were called the Three Greenhorns because the people in New Westminster said, oh, nothing's ever going to happen up there. Everything is going to happen on the Fraser River where our little city is. And so who got proved wrong there over the years? John Morton, Sam Brighouse, William Hailstone. Morton has a little street named after him in English Bay. Sam Brighouse, well, if you go out to Richmond, you ride the last station on the Canada line going out to Richmond is the Brighouse station. So you can figure out where, where he ended up settling. And then Hailstone, I, I really don't know um, anything about. But in, in 1862, on that little bluff of land just past the uh, Blue Ribbon Tea Company building, so that's just about a block west of here, they built a cabin. And so this was this beginning of the, the kind of white settlement of what ended up becoming Vancouver. They, they were called the Three Greenhorns too, and, and it was called the Brickmaker's Claim. I didn't mention that. They, because they had the idea, um, and you've got to cut them a bit of slack here because they're English. They have the idea that they, they came out into the middle of the most beautiful forest in the world and decided that what they wanted to do is make bricks. And they discovered um, a seam of clay out near where the Bay Shore Inn is today. And they thought, well, clay, and they could get coal was quite easy to find. And so they thought that they could make bricks and that would be good for the city. But that came to nothing. And then as it became evident in 1881 that the Canadian Pacific Railway was going to come to the West Coast and that the terminus was going to be at Burrard Inlet, they decided that they were really better off to be in the real estate business, like so many who have, who have followed them. And they surveyed their brickmaker's claim there as the city of Liverpool in 1882. So we could have been in Liverpool 2.0, I suppose, here um, at, at that time. The Canadian Pacific, of course, had different ideas and the general manager, it is said, recommended that this new city be named Vancouver. And so I've got a kind of a change of color there um, uh, between the city of Liverpool and Vancouver, but it was all incorporated as the city of Vancouver in 1886. But the curious thing is, and, and just one of these little geography things, if you go down Burrard Street, you see maybe only half the streets go straight through. Georgia does, for example, Robson does, um, Nelson does, I think Davy does. But a lot of the other, the West End streets don't line up with the streets that are on the east side of, um, of Burrard Street. And that's because of the difference between these two different surveys. So the next time you're doing a little jog to get into the West End, think of the, green, the three greenhorns in the city of Liverpool. So the whole thing, as I say, became the city of Vancouver in 1886. Important day, May 23rd, 1887. Um, this little city of Vancouver of about 5,000 people, they turn out to the foot of Howe Street, so immediately below us here on, on the waterfront, to welcome the first uh, transcontinental train arriving. And, um, but the Canadian Pacific wasn't just a railway, it was a sort of a package deal. And with wonderful steamships, the, the Empress ships, the Empress of India, the Empress of China, the Empress of, the Empress of Japan, and so there was this idea very much in the mind of British people of that, that you could travel the world on what they called the all red route. And all red meaning that on maps of the time that all of the imperial possessions of Britain were tinted red. And so you could travel around the world and never effectively go off British soil. So, you know, just the, the 
um, I guess you would call it the apogee of, of imperialism and colonialism at that time. And then of course the development of the, in, of the uh, industrial harbor came up at the same time. So this is Vancouver about 1900. A postcard interestingly enough published in Ontario. And so little Vancouver, and this is looking from the first Hotel Vancouver that was at the corner of Georgia and Granville Street. So, you know, postcard, not very good resolution. So we'll go in a little bit closer here and the arrow is pointing to the first Vancouver Club, which stood immediately to the east of us. The, um, so the immediately to the east of us, that was the first Vancouver Club building. And then you zoom in on it and you see in the distance what was the Squamish Reserve and possibly you can spot the spire of the St. Paul's Mission Church, which is still there on the Squamish Reserve in North Vancouver. What was the city like at that time? Well, as the 1890s go into the 1900s, um, it's quite a militaristic period. Um, Britain being involved around 1900 in a war with the Afrikaners, the, the Boers in South Africa, and that stirred up a lot of patriotism here. Um, there was always the issue through that, that time of, you know, what were the Americans doing on the other side of the border? And so there was, there was quite a lot of mobilization of people. And so this, um, this slide so shows the DCOR, that's the Duke of Connaught's own rifles. They're, they're now known as the British Columbia Regiment and that's the regiment that uh, Harjit Sajjan, who was very recently the uh, Minister of Defense in the federal government, he was the colonel and the commanding officer of the British Columbia residents. And Canby Street Grounds, where's that? Well, that's the place where they are digging a hole now for building the new art gallery. And if it's just a normal hole or whether it's a financial hole, I guess we will see <laughs> as, as time goes along. But you can see, you can see the combination of church spires. Um, in this case, I think both those churches were Protestant. Uh, quite grand houses, but still more or less a working class area of Vancouver. Let's say that you've, you've got a Sunday, they give, you, they give you a day off work, or you probably maybe got off work at noon on Saturday, and you'd go and do something, probably you would go to English Bay. And in the summertime, you would swim, or you would, you would get a canoe or go along. And if you were a little kid, you were probably taught to swim by Joe Fortes. And this is one of the few sort of good news racial stories from that entire era that this man from Barbados, Joe Fortas, became the beloved lifeguard and the kind of steward of the English Bay Beach. Let's say it's 1920s, 1930s. You want to go for a drive? So you go out to Spanish banks and, you know, Pretty, pretty unfettered sort of a thing. There was a road paved by the municipality of Point Grey. So who's that? That was Vancouver, west of Camby, south of 16th Avenue, between 1908 and 1929. So in 1929, everybody consolidates into the city of Vancouver, but in the early days, the southern boundary of Vancouver was the 16th Avenue. So you're chugging around in your car and you're, you're going up there, um, you might stop by, have a look at the University of British Columbia, um, which was announced with grand fanfare in, uh, in a plan by the architects Sharp and Thompson. This was before the First World War. And then the war came and then the depression and the election of um, this very parsimonious liberal government under a man uh, um, named Honest John Oliver. He was just John Oliver, but he was, a, he was also called Dirt Farmer John Oliver. And he, didn't have, he and his government didn't have a whole lot of time for post-secondary education. So the grand plan for UBC never got developed with the stone buildings, the kind of collegiate Gothic buildings that, um, that had been planned. And these, these uh, scruffy little buildings that were the temporary ones are still there, practically a century later. 
You continue around in your car, it's the late 20s or into the early 1930s, and you might decide that you would try this new experience of dining in your car at the White Spot <laughs> Drive-In at 67th and Granville. And that was a real uh, landmark of the car culture and, and, and of uh, my childhood and my early years. Let's say that you wanted to go somewhere further than here. Not likely in the 1920s you would have gone to the Vancouver airport. Um, this is when the airport was in Richmond on Lulu Island on Garden City Way. And one of the funny little stories about Vancouver is that when Charles Lindbergh, who had flown the Atlantic, um, decided he was going to do a tour of cities of North America, he passed up Vancouver because Vancouver didn't have a suitable landing field that he thought represented the future of, of, uh, of aviation. Vancouver um, got onto that and said, okay, we have to have a proper airport. And, and in classic civic government form, they made plans to do that right at the onset of the Great Depression in 1929. But the airport did open early in the 1930s and then commercial aviation began from there. If you wanted to do something, let's say you wanted to go to West Vancouver, you'd take the ferry. You would go to the ferry wharf at the foot of Columbia Street in Gastown, so that's just a block, a block this side of Main Street. And you get on this little passenger ferry that would chug over to, uh, to Ambleside and if you've been over there lately, you'll see that the uh, municipality of West Vancouver has just restored the old ferry ticket office building there, and it's now a community art gallery. Really nice little job that they've done there. If you wanted to go to North Vancouver, there was a ferry, and it was actually a car ferry that went from the foot of Columbia Street. You're on your bike or you're in your car, you might want to go around Stanley Park this is one of these real, real curiosities of, of, of Vancouver history. You have the displacement of the indigenous village of Hue Hue there to create a park. And as they said at the dedication of the park in 1889, for all creeds and customs. And, but it displaced all these people. And yet it created what was probably one of the great urban design decisions um, in, in, in North American history, of having this entire peninsula being open there. This is what it looked like in the, uh, in the 1940s. After 1938, you could drive across it because the Lionsgate Bridge opened. A Depression-era project with Guinness family money out of Northern Ireland, and uh, done at Depression-level wages, but, uh, but very, very effective. Let's say you went, you went all the way to Horseshoe Bay and you could get on a black ball ferry and you could, you, could go over to, uh, you could go over to Gibson's, you could go to Bowen Island and they had other services that connected all over the Salish Sea as we now call it. And black ball ferries kept going until they, were, they had a crippling strike in 1958 and the provincial government of W.A.C. Bennett said enough's enough, we're going to put together our own ferry service. So the result in 1960 was the BC Ferries Corporation. How about a trip to Seattle? You could go on CPR Princess Liner that uh, went to Seattle, uh, sorry, went to Seattle, went to Victoria, what they called the triangular, uh, the triangle route of that. And uh, you'd leave in the evening, you'd have a nice little berth, have a sleep, wake up in Victoria, nothing's happening there, you go to sleep again, sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> But it, but it was a, it was a, a period of, of really an effectively quite elegant travel. And of course, if you were going to go to Asia, you would go by ship at that period. And you'll see the UR here, and that's the building that we're sitting in right now, as this was probably 1930s. What was the rest of the city like? Well, busy, a busy, busy of downtown Granville Street. And this is one of these things where you, you, you get involved with history and it, and it becomes a rabbit hole. You become a little bit of a detective. Um, how would you date a picture like this? 
You know, when, when did this happen? Well, the cars are driving on the right. So therefore, it's 1922 or later, because they changed the rule of the road here from driving on the left to driving on the right at 12.01 a.m. January the 1st, 2022. What could possibly have gone wrong? <laughs> um, but th there weren't that many people with cars, and apparently there were no, there were no accidents. And the people adapted really quite quickly to driving on the right-hand side of the road. Why did they make the change? Because a paved highway had been connected with the United States the year before. And the Americans, as we know, of uh, buying gas in gallons and everything, they don't change real fast. So, um, so they move that around. So you look at this and you say, okay, the cars are driving on the right-hand side. And if you can see this closely, you'll see the streetcars are driving on the left-hand side still. And, and so it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to see there, but there was this transitional period where the BC Electric Railway had to take the streetcars and turn their, um, uh, put the doors around onto the other side so that it could be a right-hand side uh, sort of a thing. So this is somewhere, right, you can date it just on the basis of the trams running on the left-hand side, the streetcars running left-hand side, and the cars running on the right-hand side. And don't argue with me, you see the sign there, don't argue. That's the slogan of a local tobacconist. Con Jones makes the best tobacco. And so the don't argue signs were up around town and, and uh, Con Jones was an Aussie. He was here, he uh, was a great sports promoter of the, of the period. He had pool halls and tobacco shops and, and uh, all, of this, uh, all of this type of thing. Come forward a little bit. We're sort of getting into living memory time. This is the 1950s again. You know, your, your historical sleuth looks at it and you say, those look like the remains of streetcar tracks on the street. So this would be sometime probably 1955, 1966. More recognizable maybe at night. It's, um, I think, 10 past 6 on that clock. So winter, winter night, the neon on the, on the wet streets, that real Vancouver of, of everybody going out to the movies, everybody going down to, well, bowling, play pool, go to the arcades on Granville. And looking at it from up above, so we know that this is after 1957 because that's when the BC Electric Building, that, that big high rise they, uh, it w was built. And, um, because there was such an abundance of power and the BC Electric Company was determined to say to everybody, you can use all the electricity that you want, um, they left the lights on all night. So it was just this great big beacon that was there and BC Electric continued until I think 1962 and it was taken over by the provincial government. So yeah, the sort of the, the, the Vancouver theater strip going on, but it wasn't really the place to go in the 1950s, 1960s. That was Chinatown. And as a heyday of neon and wonderful restaurants and nightclubs, the Chinatown of the 50s, 60s, into the 1970s, that was, that was really the place where everyone went there. Bamboo Terrace sign on the right-hand side, the, uh, the, the Ming's restaurant, and, and all kinds of, just something for everybody in that, in that place. Getting a little bit closer to where we are sitting here, Granville Street on the left-hand side, that's Granville Street at Hastings, and you see, okay, you recognize most of those buildings. Look at all the streetcars on, on the street, so that's something that's different. This would be a 1940s postcard. And that photograph that's on the right-hand side is looking west along Hastings to where we're, we're sitting here today. And just that, notice that building, if you can see it, the, the big stone building on the left-hand side there. I'll be mentioning that a little bit later because that was the first location of the, um, of the, of the quarters for the Georgian Club. And uh, we'll be coming back to them just a little bit later on. 1940s Hastings Street, two, let's say two-thirds of the way along 
the picture on the right hand side you can see the Vancouver Club there. Um, and then the picture uh, framed by those buildings you can see the Marine Building there. And, and the Marine Building is sort of a cautionary tale for anybody who would want to go into real estate development because they started it in 1929. It was a Toronto group of developers, so we don't have any pity for them at all. <laughs> but they, they were effectively bankrupt when the building was completed in 1930, 1931, and looked around for a buyer. And some of you may have seen John Mackey's column in the Vancouver Sun quite recently, where the building was offered to the city of Vancouver as a city hall. And Vancouver turned it down because the idea, well at that time they didn't have the money to buy it, but also they had ideas of maybe extending out into like south of Falls Creek into the new part of Vancouver that had just been put there. But you know, one of the tremendous landmarks of Vancouver. Just another one I, th I thought that was kind of fun, the motorcyclist doing, I guess, precision riding in 1946 at the Diamond Jubilee Parade. So two years later in California, the Hells Angels are founded. So there's a little bit of a difference between these guys and then, uh, and then what happened after that. And then the Vancouver Club itself. So the old building, this is 1930 when there's a sort of for sale sign up for building. We're right, in, right at the serious time of, of the Great Depression of this. And I guess the Vancouver Club is trying to sell its old building at that point because it's got its new building built in, in 1914, same architects as, uh, as the ones from UBC. And uh, so this is very shortly before the, um, uh, shortly before the, uh, the old building was demolished. And so Vancouver Club, and, and, and what can one say in general about this? Um, where, did, where did men drink? Where did women drink at that time? Well, men drank in saloons, effectively. So, so this is great old photograph of, of that period um, uh, there. And um, not sure where women drank, but ladies drank at home. I guess you would probably say that. And so as a society, uh, the, the, the society at that time was homosocial. That wonderful word that pops up occasionally in academic writing, homosocial. Men hung out with men, women hung out with women. So it's sort of like living in Australia. <laughs> the, um, or, or at least as Australia was until recently. And the, um, and a, fr a friend of mine and I were, were having a conversation about where was the ladies' entrance into, uh, into the Vancouver Club during all of this period between the 1890s until, well, well, we'll get to it, until quite recently, because the, the club was, was a male, men's only club. So the men's entrance, the front door. And, uh, and we, were trying, we were trying to remember, and I'm trying to remember of coming here in 1970 and whether, like I would have been with my girlfriend and I guess we would have gone in through the ladies' entrance. Um, and, but we're, we're, we're trying to remember, and so any of, any of you members who've been around for a long time and can remember back to that, that would answer that question. But again, it was this idea of the separation of people by, by sex, effectively, by, by gender. Picking up on, on men's clubs, in, particularly in Britain, but really everywhere, and, um, and the, way that, uh, the way that people lived. But the next question is, so why, why is the Vancouver Club here? And if you, if you said to somebody now, um, well, the Vancouver Club is really in the heart of the business district of Vancouver, and that would be correct, and really works very, very well for, for the business community being here. But was that the case 100 and some years ago, 120 years ago when it was founded? And the answer to that is no. Uh, the answer that it was built here because this was the most prestigious residential area in Vancouver. So as an example, the CPR's doctor, Dr. Lefebvre, 
had his grand turreted house at the northwest corner of Hastings and Granville. So that's the big turreted post office building that's just a block or so from here. And that house in the background, that is either the house of Richard Marple, okay, so CPR executive, gets a part of town, Charles Dunbar, a real estate developer, we know where his real estate holdings were, um, or, or possibly a man by the name of Henry Abbott, who uh, has got a street named after him, and he was a Western superintendent. So all of the people, the CPR executives and the people who were doing very, very well in industry in the 1890s and the early 1900s had houses along here, effectively. Right across the street, Thomas Townley, who was mayor of Vancouver in the late 1890s, had this house. And if you can spot it there, there's a, there's a nice wooden sidewalk for people to walk on. You see the edge of a conservatory on the left-hand side. So, you know, there's just, there was a real, real fad for growing palms and growing ferns and so on indoors. And, um, and so that was his house, as I say, almost across the street from here. And west of Burrard Street, so just going west from here a block, Hastings actually had a different name, Seton Street, as part of that city of Liverpool um, division that we said. But it was popularly known as Blue Blood Alley. And, uh, and so this continued on for a period. And, and you know, looking for photographs of what kind of, uh, what were the houses and who were living, uh, who was actually living there. This photograph that's up there now, this is obviously after 1930, say, because the marine building is completed. But in the 1890s, okay, John P. Nichols, that's Macaulay Nichols Maitland, the realtor. So you can imagine them being extremely active in a time of uh, enormous immigration into Vancouver. Another man, um, Alfred St. George Hammersley. Now he's the closest thing that I know of, of, of a real British toff, you know, a real kind of quite upper class, well-educated, Oxford graduate man, and he was the city solicitor for Vancouver in the 1890s. Um, a rather imperious character, you might, by looking at him, and um, never been able to find a photograph of his house. Um, the one flash of humor that I've ever heard of from him is that he had a sign that he put on his office door when he went out, and it said, out on business. And business was the name of his horse. <laughs> But there was a, a, an occasion in the Vancouver Council minutes where um, the, uh, the city mayor, who owned a kind of a dry goods and ceramics company, um, took him to task over something. And, and he apparently drew himself up and he said, I will, I will not be judged by a mere purveyor of chamber pots. <laughs> you know? So quite the, quite the character. And he ended up moving back to... Uh, moving back to Britain after an attempt at farming in the Fraser Valley, there's an area, if you know the area near Agassiz very well, there's an area called Hammersley Prairie still, based on his, him being there as a settler. But he ended up going back, and he was a British MP for a number of years in the, uh, in the 19-teens and the 1920s. Other houses, um, the Bell Irving family, for example, Dr. Duncan Bell Irving, um, so 1121, Seton, that's 1121 West Hastings. I think that's his big hotel uh, there. You see the date on this, 1922, and it's become the, the, um, uh, the mission for seamen homes. So obviously the wealthy people by the 1920s, even by the 19-teens, had moved out from here. The Bell Irving building itself was just down the end of the block. That's the Vancouver Club on the right-hand side. And the real key player in this, Henry Bell Irving, trained as a civil engineer, came out here with the construction of the railway, and he made a fortune in, in fish packing. And the Bell Irving family, of course, have been very significant in British Columbia. A quite recent lieutenant governor is an example of that. And so fish packing, um, this fishing on the Fraser River, a, a, a postcard from probably more than a hundred years ago. Um, 
indigenous people employed for wages in doing something that they used to do on what was effectively their traditional fishing grounds and a lot of Japanese people being involved there. Um, you got a spare day, go to Steveston, go through the Gulf of Georgia cannery. It's the most astonishing kind of multicultural, interesting uh, look back on that period. And uh, the Japanese community was settled uh, very strongly in, in, in Steveston, but then also a little bit to the east of here uh, near Oppenheimer Park, so Powell Street effectively. And so Oppenheimer Park, where does that name come from? Well, David Oppenheimer is second mayor of Vancouver. There's a little statue to him right at the entrance to Stanley Park uh, off Beach Avenue. Um, wholesale grocer, he went west to California at the beginning of the, uh, of the gold rush. And he and this consortium that he had were the main competitors to the Canadian Pacific Railway. They owned a lot of land on what's the east side of downtown effectively. So you think east of the CPR land that was uh, around this area and, and heading further south. Um, he, um, and they named, they named what was the, the Powell Street grounds Oppenheimer Park for him. Interesting thing about him, uh, he was Jewish and he was a member of the Vancouver Club. So there was this brief window in there where, where before the kind of racial restrictions began to get locked down in Vancouver society that allowed him to be mayor at that time. One other character from that period, Richard Winch. So the Winch building is just down the street here, adjoins the old post office building, everything being put together into what we now know of as Sinclair Center after Justin Trudeau's grandfather. Um, and uh, Winch was another character who made a lot of money with canneries and with fish packing. And he didn't actually live on Seton Street, he lived in the West End on Comox and known as being he imported the first two Rolls Royces into Vancouver in 1912. So this is kind of serious money. And that West End of that period when people were moving away from the immediate environs of the Vancouver Club and moving into the West End and then of course after 1910 when Shaughnessy Heights opened up, moving even from the West End to Shaughnessy Heights. And by, by 1910, the West End had begun to have rooming houses and tenants and apartment buildings and everything. And so the people with money who wanted the kind of exclusive life that they could not have anymore in the West End, and they certainly couldn't have had on, on, in the Blue Blood Alley area here, they moved uh, to Shaughnessy. Um, other men's clubs of the period, if you can, you can see that. The facade of this quadra club is still there, um, effectively attached to the, uh, the building, quite a grand building that, that, that's been erected just immediately to the west of the marine building. And I was trying to trace through directories where they were and I see that the, the Loyal Order of Moose were there from 1940 to 1950. So very, very Canadian, I suppose. And then, um, and then Terminal City Club was there for, uh, for a while, um, while their premises in the Pemberton building, which is just to the east of here, were being renovated. And I believe Terminal City Club is still operating. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. And, yeah. So the, um, the main thing here. But as we, were, as we were saying earlier, that it was homosocial, right? That, that only men, uh, only men here. And, so what did women do, or, or let's you know, use the language of the time, what did ladies do? And so ladies had the Georgian Club, founded in 1911. And I made a brief mention of a building that was a little bit to the east of here on, on Hastings Street where they had their, their first quarters, I guess you would call it. And uh, then they moved, uh, they moved, I think, once to Richard Street, once to Seymour Street. And um, then in 1983, they bought this little Royal Bank building at the corner of Hastings and Homer. And, um, and that, was a great, that was a great place. Um, if you, if you, to be invited to speak there 
in, in the 80s as, as I was. Such an intelligent group of people. And these were, these were the women who were effectively keeping um, charities going, that, that uh, you know, supporting all sorts of organizations in Vancouver. In that kind of bifurcated world where the men went to work and then, uh, you know, the women, the women did charity work and so on, but did enormous work for Vancouver, um, uh, social services and so on. Um, you don't hear about them much, and if you could read this, uh, uh, if you could read this little clipping, it says the club frowns on publicity, according to Executive Secret Secretary Kay Selkirk, who has been with the club for 20 years. Members decided in 1911 they didn't want any publicity, and it has carried right on. So researching them is be a bit of a a, a bit of a chore for people, but anyway, again, um, a, a very interesting group, and. Um, some of the people, uh, the, the people I know, one of the co-founders, a woman named Julia Henshaw, who um, I've been very, very interested in over the years and actually did a kind of a graphic biography of her. Um, she was a novelist, she was a newspaper columnist, she wrote Mountain Wildflowers of Canada, the first uh, botanical guidebook to the Rocky Mountains that came out in 1905. And you can see her there looking rather posh as a, as a Canadian celebrity. This is in a, from a Toronto magazine in uh, about 1902. And interesting, the evolution of what she did because she started off writing under a male pseudonym and then switched to writing novels under her own name in 1900. So, you know, beginning to move forward in some ways rather progressively. And in the First World War, she um, ran the um, uh, brigade of the French Red Cross on the Western Front, and she, she and her group, and she, she received it, won the Croix de Guerre for ambulance driving during the First World War. So these are really fascinating women whose stories have not been told completely yet, and, uh, and I hope they will be told. The, um, the Vancouver Club becomes mixed sex in the 1990s. Um, this uh, little newspaper clipping says 1996, the Wikipedia page says 1993, but regardless of that, women became full-fledged members of the Vancouver Club in the 1990s, about 30 years ago. And uh, this uh, little uh, Malcolm Parry uh, quote here, um, the, uh, it says, the Vancouver Club is reportedly losing big bucks from an all-day dining room the club has halved its entrance fee, but there's a veritable bride ship and hefty dowry sailing its way. You could never write this stuff now. It's, it's the entire women-only Georgian club, which gave up its own nearby quarters recently and has 1.5 million or so in the bank. So just to wrap up, going back to that 1891 building, the, um, you'll see that, that archway over the front door and, you know, said that, uh, you know, it just, just ended up in the, in the pile along with everything else when the building was demolished in, in uh, 1930. But one of our members, Richard Toporowski, and I think Richard's here today, um, Richard uh, got in touch with us. There's Richard over at the back and someone's just pointing at him and he's waving. And he pointed out that that archway over the doorway ended up in Central Park in Burnaby. You all know where Burnaby is, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Jubilee Grove Arch, and, and it was, um, it was a, erected there apparently in 1939 as a kind of a gesture of the, of the close ties between Vancouver and Burnaby at that period. So this little relic of the building that was just next door to us here um, and it still exists out there. And um, if the temperature ever gets up into the double digits, I'm gonna go out there and have a look. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Vancouver Club members. Thanks. Thanks.